whispered that this conference is coming to being. Um, Shona Roberts here. No, I can't see her. Shona works um, in the same building as us at Sign and Link. And about a year ago, she wafted this little bit of paper at me and said, here, fill this in. You might get some money for resources. And then a year later, I stand in front of all these people, and I wasn't expecting that. Um, but we filled in this bid for the Council of Europe, not really quite knowing what it was all about. And ourselves and another group in London have, have won the, the, the two bids. And as a result of that, they gave us some money which is funding this today. I would hate anybody here to think that a sign and link is swilling around in money and that we can put on a day like this. We cannot. And I'm going to be so cheeky. But you know, your lunch is free, the conference is free. If you wish to put a donation towards your dinner, feel free. Right? I'm sorry to be cheeky. this morning to really break through some barriers to help people who come here as asylum seekers and refugees to wrest some control over their lives. That's how important ESOL is, in my opinion. So this is the, um, the third rollout of this in the UK, and as I'm going to go on and explain, the materials that I'm going to be sharing and just showing you some samples of today are being rolled out in seven different countries in Europe. They've been translated into seven different languages and if people are starting to use them, they will be translated into more languages right across Europe. So we're at the start of something here. We're at the rollout and the launch of something that I think could be really important important and could be really useful. And my job today is to introduce you to the materials, but your job, please, is to just consider, what can I do with these? You might be sitting there now thinking, Esau, I don't know anything about this. There are a hundred people in this room and if everybody really thinks, as I'm talking and as you are discussing, what can you do with this? Do I know somebody who can use this? If you're strategists, who can you pass this to? Who do you know that can absolutely do something with this? If you have a spare room in your parish, what possibilities are there? And that's really what I want you to think about. Um, so that we can really start using this information. Okay? Nice, right, so now I've got to get this in there. <coughs> so, the Council of Europe, first of all, I thought, well, let's find out what that's about, really. <laughs> so, you know, I am start at the starting of this. So I did a little Google. So I found out basically about the Council of Europe. So, founded in 1949, <coughs> post-war to uphold peace. Can't argue with that. 47 member states currently, and it covers 820 million people. And the European Court of Human Rights is a subsidiary of the Council of Europe. And what they're trying to do is to think about integration. And these materials have been written as a result of 
a 2014 UN resolution asking member states to really praise approaches to integration and social cohesion due to the current levels of migration. So, you know, as one of those peaks of migration that happened in 2014, people were starting to be concerned about what was going to happen when people came into Europe. How can we look to the future to integrate people? So they undertook research for a couple of years, and last year these materials were produced and were rolled out in Italy. In addition to basic food and clothing, the knowledge of the language of the host country was the most important thing. So now we are just at the point where we are starting to consider how can we do so. Now, I think this quote is really interesting because it's exactly the opposite of what we do. In this country, if people want to get citizenship, if they want to get residency, they have to reach a certain standard of English. These materials are coming from a different standpoint. They're saying that language proficiency develops through real life use over time. Real life use doesn't really happen if you are lonely, isolated, in a room somewhere, not integrating with the local community. It's very difficult to become proficient in language, especially in scouse. <laughs> so language proficiency, they are saying, is not a precondition for participating in society. It's a result of participating in society that you need to break down barriers early and you need to get to know people in your community early in order to integrate. So it's the opposite of what we do at the moment. So they have produced a toolkit. I hate the name toolkit. Here it is. A toolkit. And it's, it, uh, there are 57 sections to this. Now, I'm sure some of you would wish that we had actually produced this for you. We don't have the money to do that, and there is a green agenda, and all of it is on the internet. And I will show you at the end, hopefully, how to get on and how to find it. It's really easy to find. But the uh, toolkit is for non-specialists. And it's offering informal support to help asylum seekers. So it is not for classes, it is not for college, it is for kind, open hearted people who want to help and befriend others. ask you to do is just to have a little look in your packs. So there should be a colourful colourful that looks like this. It could be green, it could be pink, it could be yellow, depending on what colours we could find last week. And in here we have some samples of uh, some of these, what's in the toolkit. And the first thing is, I've taken it from section number 17, and it's about challenges to learning to read and write in a new language. Some of us might have managed that before, some of us might be hopeless at that. I've got English and a tiny bit of French and a Prosecco, is it all I can say? <laughs> <laughs> Right 
or wrong. What I'm really interested in is as you have a go at reading those two passages, what do you feel? Okay, that's what I'm interested in. And I would really like perhaps somebody on each table just to write on a post-it note five words that came up with how you feel when you are trying to decipher, decode what's in here.
she learned confidence. And, uh, she learned the, uh, who's all strength, friendly, and everything. Everything is a good, good thing she, she teach me. She teach um, I feel me not alone, you know. Nobody, I, I, because of me, I need that. Nobody knows. I don't find me. I'm alone. No friend, no everybody, you know. Uh, for me, it's really very hard. But if Christmas, she take me from home. Christmas is hard. Um, she call me, what are you, what are you doing? Uh, the first time, I'm here, 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 you know. If I eat medicine, no stop here, I go asylum, no stop here, you know. I feel with my family, you know. Everything, asylum is big um, for all people, you know, for me, you know. All, any problem, all the people who are asylum, they fix it. Okay. For paper, for everything, you know. <coughs> yeah, of course. Uh, okay, all good. Thank you very much. Like and ask Layla what you can remember about how it was when you first came to Liverpool and then how learning English helped you in what ways. Good morning everyone. Good morning. My name is Layla. I've been to England like, uh, since 2014. I've been to London uh, and after I'm back to Morocco, same day, and I'm back to England again. And the immigration sent me to Liverpool. Uh, this is my first step in this country. Uh, first time I cannot say nothing in English because uh, I'm leaving school really early and uh, I'm leaving all my life in Morocco. And when I'm coming in this country just high and by, <laughs> I can't say nothing in English. I cannot go to do my shopping or especially for the money or say what I need from the shopping. Uh, I was in Greenbank uh, hostel and I was that is close to me. And I stay all the time in my room because I cannot go out to do my shopping. I was pregnant uh, in a very difficult situation. And one day I met one girl, uh, she living with me in a hostel. She's from Eritrea and uh, she's called Rahua. And she told me, why you stay all the day in a room? Uh, why you not go in with me in a side room? And when I was, I tell her, okay. And I'm holding her hand. Uh, she's young, and me, I'm open her. I'm holding her hand like that. I was frightened to go out to see people, to see different people from my country. I cannot speak in English. I was frightened, alone. Um, I was really scared and lonely. And the first time in uh, asylum me, I met some people who say hello, and I say just like that. I cannot talk. And if you are hungry, you can go to the kitchen and have some food. And I'm really shy to me, no, it's free, you can have some food, it's really free. You can have tea, and people ask me, are you okay? And of course, the first things I cannot understand, my French explained to me. And there is one day, I met Brandy, I was crying, sitting in a chair. It was a barbecue party, the people, they make a barbecue, party for all people. And she told me, why are you crying? And she took me a photo with her camera. Not be crying. And <laughs> <laughs> I did not explain to her, she told me, just relax and cry, and I will understand you. And I'm talking to her, it's my second language, it's French. And she understood the French. And I explained to her my situation. And she carried me and she met me with a lot of people. And the first person, and I'm so pleased to, to be today here to say thank you very much for Father Peter. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Okay, 
Then they walked along to the Everyman, and they let us have a look in the auditorium. We went to the film, and the orchestra was rehearsing. It was just wonderful. We sat on the suitcases on Hope Street. We talked about people coming and leaving, famous people. Then we went to the Anglican Cathedral, and for weeks we'd done work on directions and maps. And all of a sudden it all fell into place. We went up to the top and looked out over Liverpool. And we understood that Wales was just there, and they had a new language, and all of this. A wonderful day, we learned so much. Underneath, two ladies that I'm working with now find it difficult, older ladies, trying to remember. It's not so easy as you get older, as some of us know. In the middle there, I am Father Peter, wherever you are. I am growing the next generation of Evertonians. <laughs> <laughs> Is Jimmy still here? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Everton and um, we are looked after wonderfully and I have to say thank you uh, to people from Everton who have helped us so much. Underneath uh, my first class in the middle, the bottom, in that class 14 different nationalities. It was difficult and it was wonderful. Top right hand corner we went to see the Terracotta Warriors and I was very proud of myself because I thought I'd got the context right. I'd explained all about what they were going to see. And when I got there, they were really, really confused. And they said, where's the plants? <laughs> <laughs> I all thought they'd gone to a garden centre. <laughs> Terracotta, there you go. And at the bottom there, a wonderful class, a wonderful a uh, time in class when we talked about hospitals and everybody, we bandaged everybody up, we had the walking stick, we had the paracetamol, but I had a doctor in my class and I had a matron and they knew a lot more about this than I did. Okay, so fantastic. The difference of people in class, I have never enjoyed teaching as much as I do at the moment. You've got people desperate to learn eager to learn, bright, happy people when they're in class because they're part of a family of class. I teach people from Eritrea, Iran, Sudan, Libya, Syria, Somali, Malia, um, Sri Lanka, Iraq, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Russia, Angola and Zimbabwe. I don't know where some of those countries are. <laughs> it's just wonderful that the League of Nations comes to you. I've taught people between 18 and 72. I have a lady in class at the moment, she's in her 70s. First day she came, I thought she was dying. I was so worried about her. She got to the top of the stairs and we gave her water and she sat down. And then I went out, when I came out, she was fast asleep. <laughs> and she woke up at quarter to twelve. <laughs> and it was it was tremendous. And now she can she can do that walk much more easily. She can stay asleep a little bit more. But she's made friends. She's part of this group. She's learning a little bit. She's learning one word. That's wonderful. But there's other things going on. Stopping that isolation. And I have to tell you, this, this lady is called Islam, and she's very proud because it's the same in Arabic and Scouts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, on to the materials. So, the materials in the pack are divided into three sections. The first section is just background information. Okay, so in the first, I have, I've just only given you samples in there, we haven't got all this. So the first section, sections 1 to 13, just background, where are people coming from and why? Terminology, the terminology around migration is really complicated, so there's some help with that at bottom of terms. Lots of stuff about ethical intercultural sensitivities. 
how to respect the individual. And there are often people who greatly to interview. For example, when Iqbal is in my class and when she's awake, a lot of the other people won't speak. She's the elder person in that class. And that's quite difficult for me to manage. Um, attitudes towards women. Up to now, I've only ever had two or three females in my class. This year, I've got 50% of the class are female, so we don't mix so much. So I'm trying to sort of work on that. There's lots of things that you have to think about, and this just prepares you a little bit. There's a great section about Arabic, Persian, Kurdish, and Somali language. Um, for example, Arabic has no capital letters. I didn't know that. I've been teaching for five years at Asylum Link, and then I'm going on about proper names and capital letters. There are no capital letters in Arabic. Persian bird is at the end. So it's little bits like that that can help. Um, there's a very good volunteer checklist in there if you are thinking about working with small groups um, in a parish hall or something. The legal issues you're going to have to think about. In a silent link, we, are, we try never to be just on your own in the classroom with somebody with the door open. You know, just things that you need to think about. So there's a really good checklist in there. This material uses the word plurilingualism a lot. I can hardly say it. Plurilingualism. Alex in my class spoke seven languages. He knows how language works. He understands the relationship between listening and speaking. He knows about reading, how you need context, you need phonics, you need grammar and then you need word recognition. He knows how that works. And this is all about building on that people in the realism that people have. And then there's a little um, part just about what beginners really need. It's really useful. And um, in your pack, I don't think we're going to have time to do this, but if you just have a look at your pack now, Sensitivities, um, people who are very competent in language. 
sometimes I always talk about um, one amazing day I had when a professor from Tehran University was in my class. And he was, I often pair people up, we do a lot of dialogue, a lot of conversation. And he was paired up with this boy from Eritrea who'd never been to school. And I just watched them thinking, oh, should I have done that? And it was just wonderful, because they were both learning, and Razor was reframing what he was saying all the time. He was thinking about the grammar, he was perfecting it. And all the time, the Eritrean boy was listening, and he was listening and really concentrating, and they were both making wonderful progress. You know, so diversity does not have to be a problem. Quite the opposite, I think. Okay, the next section, the second section, is all about preparation and planning. So, sections 14 to 33, which again is on the internet, not the one you have, um, just talks about diversity, all the mix of people you might have in your class, how do you deal with people with low literacy, people with doctorate, doctorates, people who are way further than I could ever be. Um, people who have, you know, I've had three doctors in my class. I've got people who are van drivers, car salesmen, mechanics, all human life is there. Boys Just Brady. like you and me. Sorry? Oh, oh sorry, obviously I'm getting excited. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, so I'm, I'm not going to read all that out. The last part there is if you are setting up something, if you are setting up something, it's about the rooms that you work in, the resources you might need. We are teaching in what's basically bedrooms for, of priests in years gone by. And we have, you know, we have not made bed, they're now classrooms. They are not perfect but we've tried to make them interesting resourceful. Lots of things, is books without borders is really worth knowing about. We get a lot of books from there given to us. Um, and we try to get books that are for grown-ups. It is sometimes very difficult to find the right material, but books without borders give us lots of reading material that's interesting non-fiction at the right kind of level. You know, if you haven't got much money, it's really worth knowing then. Okay, so there's all of that kind of preparatory stuff. I'm going to be quiet again in a minute. Right, so two minutes now because we don't want to be late for lunch. I told you that uh, the Council of Europe did a lot of research and I want you just on your table to think, what did they come up with as the three most urgent language needs for newly arrived asylum seekers? And that's deliberately a little bit general, a little bit vague. But if you think of people that are coming across from wherever and they arrive in Europe, that isolation, what might their most urgent needs in terms of language, words, speaking, communication be? And I'll just give you two minutes on your tables just to think, what would that be? Okay.
but you know, not easy, then, is it? <coughs> this is what they came up with from research. Um, and I, I did frame the question in a very general way because I think it's worth the whole discussion. And perhaps we could continue this later. But anything around healthcare, like people have travelled miles, there's all sorts of physical and mental issues. And when you cannot express pain, when you cannot tell you anyone that you've got an abscess in the tooth, you know, that's or anything around doctors, hospitals, dentists, urgent, immediate welfare, you know, where they're living, where the clothes they live, all of that's obvious. And the last one I think is really interesting is that orientation. Where am I? I'm amazed, you know, and I, I shouldn't be, but sometimes you know, what is, what is Liverpool? You know, not that it's the name of the place, what is Liverpool? Let alone actually finding the way, when Layla said, you know, she stayed in her room. I talked to somebody yesterday who said he'd been practicing to go to the grocers all week, and in the end he just still went to the supermarket, it was easier to have to speak thinking about all of that. So because of those urgent needs, the last section is all activities. So the parts 34 to 57 in the toolkit are all different sort of conversation scenarios. All real life, shopping, going to the dentist, going to hospital, all of those. They're on the internet and they are general, they can be adapted to where you live, and um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a starting point. It can be embellished, it can be changed. But there's, there's lots there to get you thinking and to think about how you can do all of this. Okay, so basically, the materials for a linguistic integration of adult migrants, that's what Liam stands for, it's my son's name. So, these materials, this toolkit, it is not a grammar textbook. It's not for big classes. It is for informed groups. It's flexible, you can add to it, you can change it, you can dip into it. To be adapted, it's user friendly. So if you are one of those first people that came in and you never heard of ESOL, this is for you. This is something that can really be used. And it's designed to kind of in, to help your confidence in helping other people. Practical and it's developed to meet the asylum seekers' needs. I'm just going to say this. I know we're not meant to be political. And somebody mentioned the um, hostile environment. I like this because I believe that despite what's happening at the moment, we put on a conference like this, and it's oversubscribed in four days of people who care, people who are compassionate, people who think, you know, the hostile environment, what's that? Full of people who care. Now, these materials are all over Europe. <coughs> and I just think if we have launches like this and conferences like this, and we give people who care a starting point. We're doing something quite subversive <laughs> and something that's really important.
who do you know for whom this would be really useful? Have you got a spare parish room? Do you know somebody that would really enjoy doing this? And today's the day where you can try and find out who are the other people in here from Alton or from Wirral. How can we get together? What can we do to do that wonderfully subversive befriending? Okay? Um, there is also in your pack, and I can do it now or over lunchtime, towards the end, I'm oh, sorry, the evaluation sheet, the post event survey. Now, all the money that we've got for launching this, we'll have to give back if this is an all filled in. So, so please fill it in as much as you can. Any comments, any thoughts there? Can you, and at the end of the day, it would be nice if you left this on your table for us. We are going to offer a couple of workshops on this in the new year if anyone's interested. So, can I just finish there, and can I ask everybody for another huge thank you for Rashid, Olga, and Leila.